Hello and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, hundreds of Syrians leave refugee camps in Lebanon to return home, a move encouraged by authorities in Beirut. Protests turn violent in Iran over water shortage, experts blaming climate change, poor infrastructure as well as mismanagement for the crisis. We bring you a report on a slowly disappearing lake in the northwest of the country. Also coming up, women at the forefront of change in Saudi Arabia. Artist and actress Fatma Al-Banawi joins us in the studio to talk about a so-called cultural revolution in the ultra-conservative kingdom. But first uh, to the ongoing uh, civil conflict in Syria, which has left millions vulnerable, hungry, without basic medical help. Over the past days, hundreds have been flocking from Jordan to the border with Syria to deliver aid to some of the 270,000 displaced. Now, across the border, Lebanon has been home to some 1.1 million Syrian refugees since the war broke out back in 2011. Some of them have been slowly trickling back into the war-torn country they call home. Our uh, correspondent on the ground, Leila Molana Allen, went to meet them. Packing up their lives into a truck once again. These Syrian refugees in the Lebanese border town of Arsal are making the perilous journey back home. As Syria's civil war rumbles on into its eighth year, they don't want to wait any longer. I prefer to be back in my country, whatever happens, even if I die. More than 400 refugees were being transferred to Kalamun on Thursday. After being searched and registering with the authorities, families shared whatever vehicles they could find and joined a convoy to the border crossing. The checkpoint was open for just a few hours to let them through. Once on the other side, they're on their own. Most are heading back to areas they've heard are safe, but they don't know what they'll find when they get there. I'm going to see if our house is still standing. Oh God, we don't know. We have to go there to see what has happened. The UN says 12,000 people have returned to Syria from Lebanon this year, mostly to areas back under Syrian government control. But those from towns still under siege have little choice but to remain here. Ibtisem's refugee camp neighbours are heading home, but she's from Idlib, one of the last rebel-held areas in Syria, and doesn't dare go back yet, if at all. We don't feel safe going there. It's all death and terrorism. It's better to stay here than going there to be murdered. And there's danger in the journey itself. By 9 a.m., the temperature was a blistering 30 degrees. Nearly 50 refugees were treated for severe heat stroke, and they face an outbreak of polio across the border. But they all chose to continue. If they miss the convoy, they don't know when the border will open again. Now to southern Iran, where protests over water shortage have been turning violent over the past days, with police using tear gas to contain crowds. The gatherings have been raising pressure on President Hassan Rouhani, with many also airing their grievances about the economy. Now, here's a France television report on one of the sites hit by the drought. That's Urmia, the biggest salt lake in the Middle East. Dry soils, infertile lands, disappearing rivers. There's a deepening water crisis in Iran. In the northwest of the country, this vast desert land was once a haven for birds and bathers. Two decades ago, Lake Ermia was second only to the Caspian Sea as the largest saltwater lake in the Middle East. As a child, Majid Musazadeh used to come here on vacation. We would have had water up until here, 20 years ago. Crystalline waters to swim in. Tourists would come to this lake to bathe. Lake Omeya has shrunk by almost 90% over the last 30 years. The reasons for this, global warming, changes in temperature and rainfall, a lack of governance and poor infrastructure. But that's not all. In a bid to develop its agriculture and food self-sufficiency, the region has tapped into the rivers that feed the lake. In addition to that, since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, the country's population has doubled. Lastly, Iranians consume large quantities of water, around 200 litres per day per person. That's 60 more than the average here in France. So the government's launched a campaign to educate. 
One minute of shower equals 35 bottles of water. Two minutes of dishwashing, 12 bottles of water. There's water, but not enough. It may be a case of too little too late. And as ever, politics plays a major role. Following the nuclear deal, Austria, the Netherlands, Norway and Denmark had identified water management as a key area for cooperation with Iran. But today, with the accord hanging by a thread because of Donald Trump's withdrawal, financing may prove to be a challenge. It's uh, time now for our guest of the week. Joining me is Saudi artist and actress Fatma Al Banawi. Thank you very much for speaking to Thank us you, here on Middle East Matters. Thanks for hosting me. Fatma, you're in Paris for the Arab Film Festival, and there seem to be around 15 films that are on display at the moment, three of them in competition. That's true. I feel like we haven't really heard about or seen many Saudi movies. Is this a new phenomenon? It's interesting. I wouldn't precisely call it a phenomenon. Um, we have had a lot of films and productions happening in Saudi, coming from Saudis. But I think it was targeting more a Saudi or probably a Gulf-based audience, uh, which is why I think uh, nowadays it's more an international audience, uh, which is awesome for us. And uh, we're very happy. A lot of the directors and filmmakers are here in Paris showcasing their films. And it's been a great honor for all of us. Now, there have been some local film festivals held in Saudi Arabia. But what's particularly interesting is that movies were banned from being shown in cinemas yeah. uh, previously, even one that you yourself uh, were in. Of course, that was an Oscars submission called Baraka Meets Baraka. How does that even work? Um, so how it worked before was that we watched a lot of movies growing up. We definitely were exposed to a lot of uh, Hollywood, world cinema. I've precisely watched a lot of Italian, French, um, so many different movies growing up, uh, including Arab uh, cinema. Um, but I think more precisely, we kind of utilize the power of social media to share our content. So as I mentioned, uh, it's not a new phenomenon, but we relied more on platforms such as YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, to share and participate with our content. So it's somehow a new direction now uh, we're taking as Saudis. I want to talk about the so-called cultural revolution that mm. keeps coming up. Of course, the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is pushing for some reforms, cultural ones, social ones. But when we look at it from a Western perspective, or even many countries in the region, they still feel very minute to us, something as simple as driving. Is, are things beginning to change? They're definitely changing. Um, not beginning anymore. They are happening and change has happened. Um, driving has only taken place uh, this week or last week. And it's uh, been a great uh, impact on family members, on family dynamics, on social exchanges. And uh, it's just beautiful to witness them, to be part of them. And the most important thing for me personally is to tap on previously untapped aspects of our society and of our culture and heritage and create them or uh, produce them in art productions. I think that's something that uh, keeps me, you know, wakes me up in the morning and uh, forces me to uh, move on and produce and, and share. I'm a little bit like you. I'm forever the optimist, but I think it's <laughs> difficult to ignore that you know, some of these women that have pushed for some of these changes, uh, especially when it comes to driving, mm -hmm. the activists are still behind bars. I think um, there are some changes happening. Um, and when it comes to, you know, certain aspects of uh, these changes or who's responsible for them. I'm not in position to speak on their behalf or to speak on the government's behalf. It's not my specialty. I'm, uh, you know, I work with art and culture and that's, as I mentioned, what wakes me up in the morning. Let's hone in on that then. Yes. So with your art, of course, you are using influences from Saudi Arabia, trying to bring them over to Europe. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I think... I personally work with storytelling. I believe that stories connect us as humans, as Saudis, as French, as, you know, uh, whatever nationality, gender, race you come from, uh, storytelling connects. And that's what I continuously uh, try tapping on. Uh, whether it's a film festival that brings the story outside to the world or it's an art exhibition, I uh, work with both. Uh, that's why sometimes I work or take the hat of an actor, of a director, but also um, as an artist. And uh, 
I would aspire to always connect humans through storytelling, to share our experiences through exchanging experiences and stories and narratives, owning our narratives, owning our intimate moments and our vulnerable moments uh, and of our imperfect moments, because this is just universal, I presume. <laughs> now, what's interesting is that, of course, you've studied abroad, you've lived abroad, but yes. you very much, for the time being, certainly have decided to stay in Jeddah. And yes. the question for me to an artist is, would you not want to leave that in terms of wanting to spread your wings and express your freedom without having to be censored still to an extent, because that is going on? Yeah, um, I think my constant number one support has been my family and my dear friends, uh, my community. And without them, uh, so much would be difficult. So uh, my work is honored today in Paris and is uh, viewed by so many different people because of its content, because it's co it comes from, an, from its home. It doesn't come from its neighbor. It comes from its original uh, storyteller. And uh, the storytellers are Saudis. I like to uh, be personal with them, uh, directly engage with my community. And if I live abroad or have chosen to live abroad, it would have been different. My work would have been, I would say, less original. I'm always with originality and owning your narrative and going to the person to speak to the person about their story and not sort of resorting to a different medium or different uh, intermediate between the two. Um, if I want to do work about Saudis, then it's going to be with Saudis. And that's why uh, so it's staying my put home. in Saudi Arabia for the time being. <laughs> Fatima Al-Banawi, yes. thank you very much thank uh, for you. speaking to us here on Middle East Matters. Well, that's it uh, for this week's show. Don't forget, you can always uh, follow us uh, on our Facebook page, Middle East Matters France 24, or you can always drop us a tweet. See you next week.